So that really concludes the run through on a number of the shares across our portfolios. And certainly I don't want to give the impression that that's where it ends. Um, I must say, just listening to the various presentations, um, it, it certainly struck me that there was a significant uh, healthcare feel around them. It certainly wasn't intended. I think it was just perhaps a a bit of a subliminal nod to, to COVID perhaps. But I, I would say that in many cases, perhaps COVID is, has given us an opportunity to get into a number of these really high quality businesses that we'd been watching for some time, because a number of them certainly did, did blink in terms of their performance. Um, you know, usually very, very strong performers. Um, if I can remind you, just uh, if you do have any questions, to please post them on the site. And if I can now just ask all the various uh, panelists to uh, to join me and and we will start to run through a couple of the questions that are coming through great all right well let's kick off then um perhaps one liam while you you know you were you were sort of you've got the mic so to speak got a question here uh, to what extent do you think ping an health is being impacted by the uh, recent crackdown on tech from a, a regulatory perspective? Thanks, Mike. Um, it's a good question, and it's a difficult one to answer with a lot of conviction, um, particularly in the context of what's going on in China at the moment. Um, I, I guess as a starting point, you, you need to look at the trend that's currently playing out um, within sort of the healthcare ecosystem in China, and that is one of deregulation. So they're, they're really trying to speed up progression um, in, and, and progress in, in the space. So, you know, for us, once you can't, you can't be, uh, have total conviction in terms of there being some unexpected um, hawkish stance from a regulatory perspective, there's a couple of mitigating factors that, that probably ease, us, ease our minds a, a little bit um, without getting a completely false sense of security in that. And, and one, is, one is definitely that um, the, the, the need that it is fulfilling is, is one that has been a priority for um, the government in China for a while. Um, logically and or intuitively, it would make sense that um, the you know providing better access to healthcare, and if this is 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 something that's going to deeply benefit society, and if this is one way of doing that, particularly that first screening process to be able to identify how serious an ailment is and and and, and just basic um, access to medical care, that is something that we think um, is, is more than relevant enough to, to keep regulators necessarily at bay. But it is in a space that, um, you know, that is always going to have a lot of regulatory scrutiny. It's in a, it's in a space where um, it, it directly impacts people's livelihoods. And, and I would imagine that it's, it's built into the business model. The, the, the business was built on the fact that the, this, this is, a, is a sector that needs close um, attention and, and um, abuse of particularly um, quality medical attention or, or at least, you know, have certain standards of, uh, that, that companies need to be adhering to is, is definitely always going to play a major part in, in terms of the investment thesis. It's something that we're just going to have to keep a very sort of close eye on, I guess. Thank you, Liam. And while, you, while you've got the mic again, just another one coming through here. Is the Chinese culture moving to Western medicine and away from homeopathic treatments fast enough to favor healthcare shares? Yeah, so that so that trend has been happening for a while, um, and I mean, it's difficult to once again conclude what you know what a healthcare share is. Um, I, I, there's always there's always been skepticism around um, you know adopting Western medical um, sort of uh, techniques, but I think that that's easing, um, and and it's one that probably gets influenced a lot by um, publications from the government. So. It's, uh, it's once again something that we're going to have to monitor very closely. Um, is, it, is it progressing fast enough? It'll, it'll probably progress as fast as, as the Chinese Communist Party wants it to. It would probably be my, my, my answer to that. Great, Liam. Um, then, Dave, one coming through here for you. At what price would you sell and tell you? So it's a new category, this genetic uh, you know, genome, genome editing is, is brand new. And they're the first to show some kind of very positive results um, on, you know, on this liver disease that I spoke of. So their market cap is $11 billion. Um, so for me, it's more a question of how big should it be in our fund. But 
this is just the start of CRISPR gene editing. You know, this is going to become an enormous field. And so I don't, I don't necessarily think I'm going to sell all the shares now because we, you know, we're still waiting for, for first product launches. And in fact, we might look at investing in the other two as well, in Editus and CRISPR. So I, you know, when something, when it's a blue sky, brand new area, and your market cap is 11 billion, you know, I'd be a little bit reluctant to sell all the shares uh, yet. You know, you could certainly could still double or triple from this level. Great, Dave. Um, Henry, one coming through for here for you. Uh, would you be buying Netflix at these levels? Yeah, I would. So the interesting thing about Netflix is um, the business has taken a long time to get to profitability. And right now, relative to profits, um, it's probably priced at the most reasonable level that it's been um, for the last 10 years. So, you know, and, and I also believe that that, uh, that subscriber churn rate can come down further. So if they can drop it from 2.5% to 2%, you know, that adds 20% to the value of the business. Um, so I like it here. Okay, great. Salah, question coming through for you. What's the risk to Constellation Software if Mark Leonard steps down? You obviously highlighted what an important, uh, uh, really real doyen he's been to that business over time. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I think uh, Mark's in his early 60s, so it is something to think about. Um, if you look at the executive team, there's five members of that team. And the, the person with the shortest tenure started at Constellation in 2003. So, I mean, as a team, they've got quite a, they've got quite a bit of history together. Um, and some members of the team are a bit younger. So they're in their, in their uh, 50s, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, I think we'd be pretty comfortable that that team's been working together for quite a, a period of time and they'll be able to continue doing what they've been doing with Mark. Great. Thank you, Salo. Um, Dave, another one coming through for you here. Hi, David. Looking at CRISPR technology, do you expect resistance, i.e. in terms of adoption? I'm thinking about COVID-19 vaccine and the resistance thereof. Opinion on the vaccine. Uh, so what is the question around the, the COVID vaccines? Well, I, I think more, more around you know, whether you see any resistance to adoption and use of the CRISPR technology. Yeah. Um, mm. Well, look, I mean, I think if you're suffering from some of those rare diseases, um, it's a question of life and death. And so, you know, a lot of people are desperate. Um, so, you know, if you've got young children and, and, and they have been affected and parents are desperate for treatment. And obviously, initially, these things would be quite expensive treatments, but the prospect of a cure is just unbelievable, really. I mean, most people up to now, you know, with some of these rare diseases have, have been on some kind of treatment which maybe prolongs life for, you know, not very long. But the prospect of a cure, I think people will jump at those opportunities. Um, but, you know, if you think more around things like messenger RNA uh, vaccinations, Admittedly, these drugs have been approved much quicker than they would normally have been done because of the COVID pandemic. I mean, for example, I had my first shot on Friday, you know, of the Pfizer, which is a messenger RNA uh, vaccine. And it is really a question of life and death as well in the COVID situation, particularly in this country. Whereas I think in other countries where, you know, I think in the U.S. at the moment, 67% of adults have had some vaccination. So there are still a lot of people who potentially could become ill and die. Um, but the vaccination rate is still relatively high there. So a lot of people are saying, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not interested in, you know, you, you, there are a lot of anti-vaxxers out there. Um, but I think with the Delta variant, I think what we saw in the FT this morning, I mean, I, there's a big percentage typically of the French population that are anti-vaxxers. But with the Delta variant, a lot of them have changed their tune. And they've said, look, I'm happy to have a vaccine now because the Delta variant is, seems to be uh, easier to pick up and it's, and it's particularly lethal. So depending on the severity, I guess, is my answer, Mark. If it's very severe, 
the potential illness, you know, people are forced across the line and, and they will take, you know, the most revolutionary treatment available. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, here's one probably coming across for all of us, and please feel free to chip in with your thoughts. Um, question, what's your macro view on investing in Chinese stocks regarding the unpredictability of the Chinese Communist Party? I mean, perhaps I'll just kick off with a, a few thoughts on that. I mean, certainly it's something that, you know, we're yet again in that very awkward phase when, when you know, risks elevated, the shares are underperforming. You know, certainly history has told us time and time again that these are the times that you, you've got to hold fast. And uh, this is not the time to be questioning uh, your investment thesis. That said, um, you know, certainly I think something that we are very mindful of is these recurrent, can I call it left field uh, regulatory onslaughts. Um, and, I, you know, having covered this space for some time now, I mean, I can think of a number, particularly the likes of Tencent, if we think back not so long ago to the um, problems it had around regulation in the gaming space, for example. There it was proved that, you know, holding the line and holding fast was, was the right course of action. And certainly that's been our view up to this point. Um, but we're also very mindful that certainly there does seem to be a decided shift in terms of the authoritarian nature of the Chinese Communist Party. And we're certainly looking to manage that as much as possible through limiting our exposure. It's obviously a market that has fantastic fundamental growth prospects. It's got big companies in the right sectors that tick many of our boxes. Um, but yet it does feel like the rewards for uh, what, you, what you're investing in seem particularly elusive at the moment. So from me, certainly the message is one of hold fast, but don't forget the feeling that you're experiencing right now and in better times it would be well worth just reviewing and reevaluating your your exposure to that Chinese market in terms of your overall portfolio. I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in with some thoughts. I, I mean I, I may if I may. So Mike I think you've I think you've summarized the key points exceptionally well there. I mean if, if I could add anything um I would add that, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that China is going to become the world's largest economy. Um, the trend has been um, one of um, more accessibility from a financial service or financial markets um, perspective. So, you know, there's, they often say that Chinese give a lot and then they take back a little and then they, and then they give a lot again. So I think, you know, you, if your time horizon is right and, and you've, and you've um, got, got a sort of appropriate allocation towards the space, I think, you know, if, if, you, if you have a, a longer term view, um, you will probably find that you're going to need to uh, devote a lot more attention um, to what's going on in the East uh, in the next uh, couple of decades um, than you were in the, in the previous. It's just becoming too relevant um, for markets. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to think of is, you know, the Chinese are, are tightening up on the tech giants and maybe that's, maybe that will come in the West you know, in the next while too. So what we're seeing in China, I mean, it might be a little bit more unpredictable than we'd see in the West, but that might just be a taste of of what we might see elsewhere. Um, and it's, you know, this thing about a lot of the tech, the tech giants and, uh, you know, how they deal with personal information and, and, um, and, and looking after their, you know, their databases. So, with Lena Khan now uh, heading the, you know, the FTC, which is one of the organizations, along with the Department of Justice, that looks at antitrust issues in the U.S., you know, she's a, a more radical thinker. And in some ways, you know, the FTC is, you know, they, they've kind of split the roles. So the FTC looks after um, Facebook and um, – which is the other one? They look after fakes, Facebook and, and Apple, I think, or Facebook and, and Amazon, and the Department of Justice is looking after Alphabet. Um, so it, it might get tougher in the US too, so it might just be a, a taste of things to come. Great. And then just one further one here for you, Silo. Any thoughts on Constellation's European operations spin-off topicus? 
Yeah, so I think we can almost think of Topic Kiss as a mini constellation itself. They have a, a very similar strategy that they're uh, employing in Europe. Um, and it's just really on a smaller scale. So I think they, they have a, on a revenue basis, they're about a sixth or a seventh of the size of Constellation. And Constellation continues to have a very meaningful stake in uh, Topicus after the spin-off. So I think it's something that we're, um, we're following. We followed since the, uh, or we will follow uh, post the spin-off. Um, but, but on first glance, it does appear to be interesting given that it's a very similar setup to Constellation itself. Great, Sula. And then probably as we start to wrap up on the questions um, coming through, uh, a question here, no exposure to semiconductor shortage, already priced in question mark. So we certainly, uh, the likes of ASML didn't make it into this particular presentation, but it's certainly a share that we hold in a number of our portfolios. But, uh, you know, members of the tech team, any thoughts on, on semis at the moment and uh, why it didn't, why they didn't feature more prominently in the shares we talked about today? I mean, uh, I'm sure Dave wants to make a comment, but I'll make one quickly. I, I, I suppose we could have. Um, you know, one of the positions in our portfolio is Intel, um, and they're one of the few chip designers who also have uh, manufacturing capability. Um, and, you know, it takes years and years to build out a fab uh, to produce chips. So Intel are in a good position now to address the shortfall, particularly in the automotive market. And that's... I think there's um, some optionality in that share price because of that. It's certainly not reflected in the share price today. You're paying sort of 12 or 13 times trailing earnings, 12 or 13 times trailing earnings for the core business. Um, and that could well be an area of positive surprise over the next 12 to 18 months, I would think. So, yeah, that, that is a trend that, that is representative in our portfolios, actually. Great. Thanks, Henry. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for your attention today. There are a couple of other questions coming through around how one gets exposure to these various companies that we've spoken about today. Um, and just as I mentioned earlier on, I mean, there's just a kind of mind scatter, so to speak, of many of the other um, companies that are on our watch lists and in our portfolio. So this is by no means a suggestion that it's a very narrow picture of the type of shares we look at. There's a vast number of companies that are are in there and that we're monitoring. And I see NVIDIA as one, which would also be within the semi-space that, that we, we spoke about just now. And also, how does one get exposure? So here we've listed a couple of the funds um, that we spoke about in the previous webinar. Um, and really, it would be a case of speaking to your relationship manager and your portfolio manager to look at the various options and solutions that are available for you. I hope you've got a good flavor for how we think about shares. Um, and I hope going away with a few ideas, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I, I really believe that this is going to be a time when, you know, you're going to have to make sure that the horses in your paddock, so to speak, in terms of the shares you're invested in, um, you know, are those high quality compounders that are going to carry you through what could potentially be, um, let's say, a more challenging time. Uh, the easy money has probably been made um, and every share in your portfolio is going to have to earn its place. So I really want to thank you very much for your interest today. Um, we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time with the next uh, in the series of, of uh, seminars on offshore investing. And just thank you to the team for your contribution today. Thank you all. See you next time. Mm -hmm.